Thank you to all of you for participating in this seminar. I am Bob Toyofuku, the president of Pacific Law Institute, and it is my pleasure to moderate this talented panel. I have been lobbying at the Hawaii State Legislature for over 30 years, but I also have been sponsoring continuing education seminars, primarily to lawyers through the Pacific Law Institute, and I am using this company uh, to provide this seminar. We want to focus this morning on how the coming legislative session will be conducted because of uh, COVID-19. The panelists will be discussing the schedule, hearings and testimony, whether there will be in-person meetings available at the Capitol, and the budget and money issues. Hopefully, we have anticipated many of the possible questions to answer uh, during this presentation, but please feel free to type any questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer as many as possible as time allows. I am also planning to send some of the uh, written information that the legislators have provided me and we'll be discussing sometime next week and possibly especially the verbal testimony guidelines. Although a lot of the information will be available on the public access room uh, information. I'd like to now take a few moments to introduce the legislators on the panel, as well as the Senate president and the House speaker who will make opening remarks. First of all, Senate President Ron Kochi from Kauai has been a member of the state Senate since 2010. Prior to becoming a member of the Senate, Senator Kochi was a member of the County Council on Kauai for 22 years, uh, with 12 of those years being the chair of the council. Senator Kochi was Senate uh, Vice President become, before becoming the Senate President in 2015. House Speaker Scott Psyche was first elected to the House of Representatives in 1994. Speaker Psyche has served on many various committees during his tenure and served as House Majority Leader from 2013 to 2017. He was chosen to be Speaker of the House in May 2017 and has been the Speaker since that time. Senator Gilbert Keith Agaron was a member of the House of Representatives since 2009 and became a member of the State Senate in 2013. He is currently Vice Chair of the Ways and Means Committee and has previously served as a Director of the Department of Labor and Chair of the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Senator Jay Kalani English was first elected to the State Senate in 2000 and has served as Senate Majority Leader since 2015. Senator English is also a member of the Ways and Means Committee, which he has been a member for quite some time. And uh, prior to his election to the state legislature, Senator uh, English was a member of the Maui County Council for two terms. Representative Della Al Baladi was first elected to the House of Representatives in 2006, and she has served as chair of the House Health Committee, as well as being a member of the Consumer Protection and Commerce Committee and the Judiciary Committee. Representative Bellotti uh, has served as the majority leader since 2018 and continues to serve in that role. Lastly, Representative Sylvia Luke was first elected to the House of Representatives in 1998 and has served as Vice Speaker of the House and was previously the Chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Representative Luke has been Chairperson of the House Finance Committee since 2013 and currently serves as the Chair primarily responsible, the House Chair primarily responsible uh, for passing the state budget. So I'd like to now turn it over to Senate President Ron Kochi, who will make a few comments. Senate President. Thank you, Bob, and thank you to Think uh, Tech Hawaii for helping put this together. Uh, I'm told there are over 600 participants, so you clearly have piqued 
uh, the interests of the community. And so uh, we really appreciate you helping us communicate uh, what's going to be happening in the upcoming session. I'm not going to get into the details. I have Senator English and Senator Keith Agaran to do that. But instead, I'll just share something I shared with a conference of nonprofits a few years ago. Normally, when uh, I would come up to lobby, I like to look around uh, the individual's office and see, you know, what are the pictures, what are the degrees, what are the areas of interest, how do I find common ground to talk to uh, the person I'm about to try to lobby and get a personal connection. Via Zoom, that's going to be complicated. As you can see, uh, all of us have virtual backgrounds except Senator English and in the frame, it's difficult to make out what's behind him. And then you got a professional like Bob who doesn't want you to get any insight into what he's doing. So he has a clean background that gives you no insight into who or what he is and what he's interested in. Uh, the other thing I shared with them is that you have either uh, in the nonprofit world, especially passionate advocates who care so deeply about the issue that they are coming in to talk about, or you have clients and the clients have passion and the clients sometimes may not be aware of the process. And you're given either a 15 or a 30 minute block of time. And I recall somebody talking to me and they were showing me a PowerPoint and I can see the clock running on the screen. And when they got to 27 minutes of talking nonstop at me, and then they said, uh, so what do you think? I said, I think my next appointment is going to be walking in in three minutes. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and, you know, uh, at that point, they wound up not hearing any of my ideas, any of my thoughts. They had no clue uh, about what I thought of their presentation because they took all of the time. So be sure you monitor your time via Zoom. Uh, you know, the next appointment, my experience uh, working this way is it's in the next room waiting. So when you get to that by the minute, you click out of one meeting, you click into the other. And really, it's critical to find out what the legislator is thinking. So, you know, tailor your presentation to uh, allow enough time for that interchange to occur. But I think this is the valuable, uh, you know, the value of having seminars like this and uh, Bob trying to help you become better advocates for uh, the groups and the uh, issues that you represent. So I thank you very much for what you guys are doing. Thank you very much, Senate President. I'd like to now turn it over to House Speaker Scott Psyche. Thank you to the um, Bob, to the Pacific Law Institute and to Think Tech for sponsoring this uh, very important forum this morning. Um, I thought I would just begin with um, a couple of um, some top with some top line information um, on a couple of topics. So the first is um, just on on the House of Representatives in general. Um, so as you know, we have uh, 51 members, and this year we'll be having 47 Democrats and four Republican members. We have eight new freshman members, although one is a returning, but we're looking forward to working with our eight freshman members. Uh, we will uh, have uh, 16 commit standing committees in the House, uh, 12 in the, will meet in the morning, and four will be meeting in the afternoon. And I know that the majority leader and the finance chair will give more details on, on the mechanics of, of all of that. Um, the second thing that I wanted to just discuss generally was some of the, the guiding principles that we um, tried to follow as we plan for this session. So we knew that when we suspended our regular session on March 17, um, that we would have to begin planning for a, basically for a pandemic session. And um, there were three things that kind of guided our planning process, which began as, in March, as I mentioned. The first is public health. Um, we know that um, public health is still a top priority for the general public. We wanted to make sure that this legislative session protects the health of not only our members and our legislative staff, but also the general public that needs to interact with the legislature. The second um, principle was that notwithstanding this pandemic and, and the virtual session, we wanted to ensure that there was full access by the public to our legislative process. And that is why the, the planning for this virtual session began in March. The House and Senate uh, IT staffs worked over the past months 
to build the capacity and the bandwidth so that we could hold virtual public hearings. And then the third, er the third area is to um, just to, to set priorities. Um, the house, um, you know, the house knows that we need to focus on number one, on maintaining and building our public health infrastructure, and number two, that we need to reopen and rebuild our economy so that everyone can benefit from that. Um, one of the things that the house did was uh, to create a new committee. Um, it's called the Pandemic and Disaster Preparedness Committee. It'll be chaired by Representative Linda Ichiyama, and that committee will focus on um, all of and most of the pandemic um, issues that we are now having to deal with. So we're, you know, we're even though we're in a pandemic and even though there are limitations here, we're really looking forward to working um, with all of you as we as we uh, begin our session on January 20. And thanks again for having us, Bob. Uh, before we get into the the really heart of the uh, discussion, I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, on a brief overview. I think many of you, I'm hoping, uh, have some experience with accessing the state legislature. And we want to highlight the changes that are going to be made primarily because of the pandemic uh, and the fact that the Capitol will generally be locked down and uh, everything will be, almost everything will be virtual. Uh, First of all, I'd like to highly recommend you go to the Hawaii legislative website, which I think many of you might be familiar with, which is the key portal to get the information about the legislature and the process. And the link is capital, C-A-P-I-T-O-L dot Hawaii dot gov. Now, I recommend you spending some time uh, on the website and there is a guide done by the public access room, which is very, very helpful. Uh, especially if you look on page seven of that guide, they talk about uh, uh, hearing notification, uh, how to do testimony and uh, measure tracking. So that could be very helpful to those of you who are not as familiar with, with the process. The legislative schedule, hasn't been altered that much. And uh, Representative Bellotti and Senator English will be discussing that uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the panelists will spend time on the changes uh, that have been made. We would want to cover uh, basically the schedule, the hearing process, the testimony, especially how to do verbal testimony um, and whether you can have in-person meetings at the, at the Capitol. And of course, uh, Representative Luke and Senator Gilbert Keith Agaron will be talking about the budget and any appropriation type bills and how that's gonna be handled and the fiscal implications. So without further ado, let me turn this over to Representative Bellotti and Senator English to first talk about the schedule. Thank you, Bob. And thank you to everyone who is on this um, webinar. I think it's really important that we all kind of get ourselves ready and primed for session because the more that we prepare in advance, we will have a more successful session. Something that we learned during the pandemic or what I learned during the pandemic was that there's actually very few constitutional requirements around the legislative session. The main one is opening day, the third Wednesday of January. So we are prepared to open on January 20th. And then the only re other real requirement is the five day mandatory recess, which will be on February 25th. For as long as I've been elected, uh, I believe that the uh, legislative session had to be 60 days. But in reality, it, it's a limit of 60 days. And so what we saw during the, um, the first part of this pandemic was that we had a lot of flexibility and we recess adjourned and came back before we adjourned sine die. Um, with respect to the 2021 calendar, uh, the next, the, the last most important date is in April. April 29th is sine die. And um, I mentioned that because we do have 55 legislative days, but as speaker said, you know, we still really wanted to have full participation and um, take the time to really dig into bills. So the first part of the calendar, you know, we typically have um, first decking, 
uh, first crossover, second decking, second crossover, we still maintain all of those deadlines uh, with opportunities for committees to hold their hearings. And then we really shorten um, the, the timetable um, by taking a few days out of conference. Um, I, I think this is a reasonable calendar um, as we continue to look at developments. And one really concerning thing was yesterday's high numbers. You know, we are going to continue to remain flexible and nimble, but this is a, a calendar that has been negotiated by the House and the, and the Senate, and we think it is, it's a timetable that can really work. So I'll hand it off to Senator English for any additions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bob, for hosting it, and aloha, everyone. Um, I think Della covered it. I'll just recap maybe in um, very straight English. You know, we've reduced the number of days of recess days from 13 to 9. Um, we've shortened the conference by one week and we're ending session one week early. So usually we end the first week of May. This time we're ending April 29. So those are the main things with the legislative calendar. It was published a few days ago and that's uh, circulating. So if you get a hold of that, you, it's just posted up. You'll see um, the deadlines that we have, things like bill introduction, um, laterals and things like that. So you can see how the schedule goes and uh, that's how the legislature will operate, both the House and the Senate on this schedule. So that's the quick highlights on what's happened with the schedule. Thank you, Bob. Oh, thank you, Kalani. Uh, I'm in Santa English. I just wanted to point out to those of you that who may not be as familiar with the process, the, there are deadlines called first lateral. That means that the uh, first committees that are referred to a bill must have it heard and passed out of that committee by that time, and that's in mid-February. And, uh, um, and then there's uh, what they call the deck, the first deck, where a bill that uh, is completed by all the committees that have been referred to that bill must have uh, finished, passed it out, and filed it by that date. And so when you look on the website, and we just typed it into the Q&A box, capital.hawaii.gov, uh, you can see a tremendous amount of information. You can get a more detailed schedule with all the deadlines in it. And as uh, Representative Bellotti and Senator English uh, had mentioned, uh, there will be um, various referrals. There still may be triple referrals, that means to three committees, double referrals, which is very common to two committees, and maybe some joint referrals where two committees uh, uh, join up and have a hearing. So that kind of completes uh, the, the situation with regard to uh, the schedule. Uh, uh, can I chime in? Yeah, how can I? Go, go ahead, Rep. I, I know that the audience might be interested if there are going to be a, a reduction in the number of bills introduced. And what I would share is from the House perspective, um, we have imposed limits um, uh, since about 1997, uh, and we've seen that um, that so so the limits are 20 bills um, per member are are, um, are their limits. Uh, we have additional um, bills that can be introduced um, by chairs, um, up to 10 by committee chairs, and then up to 15 by the chairs of CPC, Consumer Protection, Finance, and Judiciary. Um, there is one change uh, for caucuses. Uh, we have a limit of five bills per caucuses. Uh, those are the official legislative caucuses that are rep uh, recognized by the Senate President and the House Speaker. So um, there is going to be lots of opportunity. What we found that when we started this project um, uh, decades ago, that that we have approximately 1,500, 1,100 bills that get introduced um, on the House side. And so uh, it doesn't stem um, robust discussion that we have. Um, and I think that uh, as we continue this practice, it's really important because we really want to focus, uh, as speaker said, on uh, really the core things during this um, pandemic that we will have to address, uh, primarily also the, the state budget, which is on everyone's minds. Right. And Bob, I wanted to talk about the Senate procedures because we're different. Um, you know, we don't have a bill introduction limit on our members. And so but we have asked the members to uh, think about the, the amount of bills that they're putting in and also uh, you know, if one member is introducing a bill, maybe not to introduce the same one again. We, you know, about referrals though, we have always referred on the subject matter of the bill. Uh, the Senate has always tried, we rarely do triple referrals, that means three committees. Um, you know, and it really just depends on the mood of our chairs because when we tried to 
do a more broad referrals. We had a huge amount of re-referrals by the chairs. And then they would say, you know, well, you didn't include us. And then when we do include them, they say we have too many committees in there. So I have to say that it's really uh, the, the referral committee will do the referrals on the merits of the bill. And we're asking the chairs then to understand that, you know, we're trying to, the overriding principle is that the bill should have a chance to make it through. And that's how we base our referrals in the, in the Senate side. Thank you, yeah. Senator. Bob, let me, Bob, go, let me go just ahead. add one thing to what Kalani said. Sure. And, and when we when we talk about re referrals, and our practice is uh, the general rule is you can't ask for a re referral just because you want to kill the bill. That's that's not uh, the purpose of a of a re referral. The re referrals are to make sure that the issues in that particular bill are going to be heard. And so if if people are asking for re referrals in the different committees this year, uh, they need to show say that they're actually plan to hear it. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I just also want to mention for those of you that uh, want to uh, have a better idea of how the House and the Senate refer bills, you need to take a look at the House rules and the Senate rules, because in those rules, they describe the committees and the jurisdiction that those committees have. And so sometimes uh, when you see a double referral, both the Consumer Protection and Commerce Committees and the Judiciary Committees have jurisdiction over a particular type of bill. And so that's how the leadership decides on the, on the referrals. Um, and uh, does uh, Rep. Luke, do you have any other comments? Thanks, Bob. Uh, one of the things that um, happens in the House is um, Unlike the Senate, um, the Senate allows um, the second committee to forego um, public testimony. Um, the House rules require that um, when bills go through the process, every committee has to have a public hearing. Um, so uh, for finance, um, you know, we usually end up hearing um, anywhere between um, 600 to 700 bills in a session. Um, it takes a lot of effort. Um, I think this year, uh, because we're trying to minimize the, uh, du the duplicative bills, um, there might be situation where uh, you might have, a, uh, for instance, a mask mandate, um, you know, changes to the mask mandate may be introduced five times and, you know, it's gonna be up to the chairs to vet out and then pick one as opposed to hearing all five bills. I think in the past, there was a tendency to hear all the bills. Um, um, and that's just gonna be a little bit more difficult this year. I think, you know, uh, uh, because we are um, in a virtual hearing, um, uh, because of, uh, you know, we're giving a lot of time for people to testify and we're giving a lot of time to ask questions, but just in this, um, process, you can see how um, things get delayed and takes a little bit longer time because it's virtual and it's Zoom. So we're trying to uh, manage that at the same time, allow for uh, great public access. Thank you, Rep. Luke. And, uh, one of the things and Bob, that- Bob, let me, let me just um, mention one thing about what the finance chair just mentioned. You know, sure. in the Senate, um, we do not, what we don't do in the second committee is if for the most part, take oral testimony again. I think that's what she's referring to. We certainly welcome uh, written testimony. And in fact, the written testimony often results in amendments that are proposed by uh, the chairs of the second committees. And those committees are usually judiciary, consumer protection and ways and means. Uh, the other thing that happens is, and this happens in the house as well, is the second committees can't just make the changes they need to get the agreement of the chairs that heard the committee earlier because those committees usually um, uh, deal with the substance of the committee. That's why we call them the, the substantive committees, the ones, the, the committees that uh, deal with the main issue in the bill, whereas the, the afternoon, the morning committees in the Senate uh, deal with money, with the legal issues, and with the, the broader concerns. And so that's uh, the gate, we kind of call them the gatekeeper committees. 
um, because you know the bills need to go through all three hearings before passing over to the other the other um, body. All right, Bob. So what what the term of art is called prior concurrence. Thank you. I have prior concurrence of the chair before before the other committees can make a change. Yeah, that's yeah, a really you. good clarification. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, one of the things that um, a lot of committees that or a lot of testifiers come to Ways and Means and Finance with substantive amendments and they present testimonies and um, and then end up getting disappointed when we don't make changes um, to the substance of the bill. Um, it's because of what Senator Agaran and Senator Kalani English just talked about, because we're trying to um, retain the jurisdiction of the subject matter. Um, you know, there's some restrictions in the second and third committees to make changes to the substantive um, portion of the bill. You know, one of the things that Senator English pointed out earlier, I just want to uh, elaborate just for 15 seconds, is that, you know, you have 51 members in the House and you have 25 members in the Senate. So historically, there always has been a difference as to how the Senate operates necessarily and the House. And the other thing that the Senate has to do is confirmations. And so that kind of lengthens the time that they have to uh, utilize to confirm boards and commissions, judges, etc. Okay, so let's move on uh, to what I think is an important part of this presentation. Uh, it's the hearings and the testimony. Uh, and I'd like to turn it over first uh, to Senator English and or Senator Keith Agaron to discuss the hearings first and then we can get into uh, the House members and then we can discuss the testimony, which is even more crucial. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bob. Well, you know, first of all, let's just, the, the, the reason that we do hearings is to inform the legislators on different aspects of a bill, how it impacts the public, how it impacts people, different views. So, you know, that's one thing that I really, I found over the years um, that people have forgotten. I'll give you a real quick example. I remember about 10 years ago, the Senate senators had to go to, to session. Um, it was the last day to hear a bill. Up, we had hundreds of people wanting to testify. Up front, we said, we're gonna pass the bill the way you guys want it, but you should let us pass the bill. People insisted on testifying. We ran out of time and the bill died. So, you know, you have a right to testify, but you've gotta let us vote, right? So that's the thing, it's like here, the hearing is to give us information, but you have to give us some time to deliberate and to vote. Um, you know, all, we the Senate will be conducting um, all of our hearings via Zoom, and then it will be put out on uh, YouTube uh, as well, shortly after, it'll be live on YouTube and then put out recorded on YouTube right after. You know, we're gonna have generally the same amount of hearings. Uh, it's not gonna lessen the amount of hearings, but we're asking the chairs to consolidate and think about how they line up their bills. As um, uh, Rep. Luke said earlier, right? Instead of hearing all five bills on the same one, choose one as the vehicle and move that one. And the other thing is that um, we still have the 72 hour notice. So our hearing notices, you have 72 hours. We put that out in a hearing notice. That's still in effect. Uh, we're asking our chairs to limit the amount of waivers that they ask for so that people know that you know the hearings are coming up. Like I said, we asked, we asked our chairs to consider consolidating the bills, but in the Senate, we do leave it up to the chairs um, for how they run their committees and how they schedule their bills and what they choose to pass out. Um, the one thing that is gonna be different on our side is we're asking the chairs to have a strict adherence to the allotted time. So think about it, we have uh, morning, committees and then afternoon committees, one committee following the next. Between them, uh, so if your time ends at say 2, 145, you have to end at 145 because we have a team that goes in and disinfects because remember we have staff working, a couple members that are in there, they'll disinfect between the, the hearings and then we have all of the online um, mechanisms, uh, everything ready to go for the next hearing. So we, in the past, we've sort of been flexible and 
the first committee will go over into the other committee's times. We're not going to allow that. It'll be a hard stop. And so we're asking people that are testifying to be very cognizant of that. You know, another quick uh, insight is um, don't read your testimony. Uh, you've already submitted it by writing. You know, you know the professionals when they say, I stand on my testimony as written. And some of them will say, you know, just highlighting, we've recommended this verbiage for an amendment that's in our written testimony. If you do that, because we actually do read the testimony. Uh, so if you don't read it, it helps us quite a bit. It helps you and it helps the time to move ahead. Um, you know, and again, we're going to accept written testimony. If you want to come on uh, uh, in person or not in person, a virtual testimony, uh, you have to sign on 24 hours in advance. Uh, you'll be given a, a slot and you'll be sent a link and the link only works for you. Uh, and you can come on and do your testimony uh, and then uh, log off. So uh, we've, we actually were putting this in shortly before the pandemic. So we have a few other systems in place uh, that we were testing, um, but it's all new territory. So, you know, work with us as we work through this and perfect it. Thanks, Bob. Senator, I have a quick question and I may have missed it. I was typing an answer to some of the questions that uh, came in. Uh, when we view the hearing uh, visually, will all of the senators be in the room uh, no. listening to or is it going to be mixed or virtual we you know we we're limiting it to i mean we're trying to set no more than five people in the room at any time so you have to uh -huh. account for the staff that's in there normally the chair and maybe one or two other committee members but the rest will be on zoom as well and so you know we have allowed for our virtual participation um and most of the members are gearing up their offices and other spaces to zoom in as they participate in the meeting. Okay, thank you. Rep Bilotti, uh from the House, how is the House going to handle the hearings, either you or Rep Luke? Sure, thank you, Bob. Similar to what Senator English said, we will be conducting virtual hearings with remote testimony um, by the public and in person, this is where there's a little bit of a difference, in-person participation by members. And so I, have, I wanna take a pause here and really send a huge thanks to our house IT, our house sergeant of arms, our house clerk, uh, chief clerk, who have done a tremendous job in getting uh, our conference rooms ready, um, both with um, fiber coming in with the audio system, uh, the, the remote video that's going to uh, be there for it to enable a good kind of back and forth uh, between members and with mem between members and the public. Uh, we will be um, having Zoom um, as our platform, and it will be live cast, live broadcast to YouTube, and then archived there as well. So that's how it's similar to the Senate. Yeah, Bob, maybe I can just add something too, since we're talking about testimony. Um, you know, that we're requiring written testimony. Uh, you know, put, said, put in something in writing because that helps us on the record, it helps us with everything. but. Previously, you could just give oral. We're saying, please submit everything written as well. Yes, we're allowing verbal testimony via, via Zoom, but we're asking for something written as well. And for neighbor island testifiers, right? So we're thinking about how will the neighbor islands participate? That's we're asking them to come in via Zoom. We're also working with um, the public access room, the state libraries, the different entities out there for people that don't have the, the the electronic capabilities. So like a lot of my constituents, for example, in rural Molokai or in upcountry Maui or in Kipuhulu and Kaupo and Hana, they can go to a specific site and participate. So we're trying to work those out. And, you know, I really have to say thank you to the public access room. They've been really, really um, helpful and really working with us on this. So that's how the neighbor island guys can participate as well. Um, we're kind of flowing into the next part of the script, but I think it's really important here because the uh, questions are starting to pile up in the chat about late testimony and how do we get a, a link and everything. I think if there's one thing that every person on this call webinar should do if you don't have it already is visit the Capitol website register and create an account for yourself and for your organization. That's going to be the single most important thing you can do to prepare because it will take you through the process of um, enabling you to submit written testimony, 
And then it's gonna be through that uh, account where your, you as an individual or your organization will receive um, a link to uh, participate remotely and, and provide oral testimony if that's what you want to do. Um, like Kalani, uh, like Senator English said, uh, where we are requiring written uh, submission of testimony. And, and I think that's actually really to the advantage of the community because that's where you can really put down all of your thoughts, put down proposed uh, amendments and those things. And really the verbal oral uh, participation is to provide an opportunity for you to enhance and amplify your message to legislators. So one most important thing is to log on and create your account right away. Yeah, thank you. And, and about late testimony, um, you know, we, we basically we're not accepting late testimony. You have 24 hours to get it in. Uh, if you do get it in, it'll be there. You know, we'll get it, we'll see it. But it, it's just think of the logistical nightmare of having to go in and create all the files for each of the committees and go back. So in the past, when it was paper and in person, we were very lenient with late testimony. Now we're saying, look, there's a 24 hour deadline and it's because we need to process once we get it our staff there's a lot of staff work behind it that has to process all of it into files put it in order put it in a way that we can read it and use it and put it away that you guys because the public access is this as well can make sense of it so we need that time to put it all together so we're we're asking you to please 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 honor our 24 hour deadline one clarification because you know I, I there are sometimes like say you're like um, you have 18 hours to go yes you will still be able to submit but your um, written testimony will likely get us a late stamp and so it may not make it in, in, into the hands of the chairs because chairs will be requesting that the um, testimony be processed and provided to them so it's really critical again especially because you're here you know it's two weeks before session has started this is the time to get ready and to work out your procedures internally with your organizations to figure out um, how to do this and one other thing that I would say because I know that there are a number of organizations here the account that are created, the account that submits the written testimony will be the account that is given the Zoom link. Three hours before um, the start of the hearing, that Zoom link uh, or the, the, the link that says Zoom requested will turn into the Zoom link to which you are going to click to be allowed in. And we are asking that uh, members of the public who do receive that link to log in 30 minutes before the start of the hearing to allow the staff to um, uh, make mic checks and make sure your video is checked and to make sure you're there and present and that any technical glitches on your end that you can take care of, you will. Uh, one last thing I would say about, about the, um, the unique uh, nature of the account is that if you are with an organization and oftentimes what we see is we see maybe the administrative assistant is the one who submits the written testimony. Internally, organizations will need to figure out which email account they're using it for. And then it's from that account that the link will have to be accessed. So again, it's, it happens with organizations. It happens with state agencies. We know routinely the person submitting may not be the person providing the testimony. So this is a really important uh, opportunity to, to lay out all of those um, processes and procedures internally for your organization. So I hope this helps. I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions and people have been asking about, you know, time to come in on the Zoom. I hope this helps answer what, what Representative Bilotti just said, helps to answer that. You know, 30 minutes before, please come on um, so that we can line you up. And, you know, it's like any other hearing, things may go faster or, or slower, um, but there is a hard stop for us in the Senate on the back end. Yeah. So one of the thing that, um, things that things um, that Senator English brought up, was, which was really important, was um, concentrating a lot of your testimony on written testimony. Um, the reason for that is um, in the past, Finance Committee did not have any time limit on the on testifiers. So um, you know, I know some of the committees allotted um, two yeah. minutes or three minutes per testifier. Finance Committee. Um, has not in the past, but as you can imagine, um, because we're opening um, Zoom um, accessibility basically to the world. So there might be issues that are of worldwide interest that we'll be taking up that you'll have people from New Zealand or um, 
from California or DC uh, logging in to testify. And we actually really want to hear from our local residents. And a lot of times, you know, if uh, we had um, bills in the past where, uh, you know, I would say a substantial amount of testimony came from out of state. And so because it's a virtual testimony, you know, they, they will all have the ability to come on and testify. If we were to take all those testimony and give um, a limited time, you know, you can imagine um, it, it could go on for hours on a certain bill. Um, so because of that, we're still unclear and we're still deciding whether we will put time limits. Um, so if that's the case, then, you know, it's more important, you know, if, for instance, if you cannot um, put all your um, uh, thoughts um, and then finish it in two minutes, it's really important to concentrate on the written testimony. So um, uh, there will be much more emphasis on making sure that, um, you know, your testimony is complete and be written and have really concise um, oral testimony. Thank you, Rep. Luke. You know, one of the things I also wanted to emphasize is that prior to this COVID-19 situation, uh, when we go into a hearing to testify, the chair always asks, is there anyone else that is willing or would like to testify? Person can raise their hand and be called up to the table to testify whether they had written testimony or not, and they have been asked to submit written testimony. This session is going to be very different and there still has to be a lot of things worked out. But because the testimony will be virtual, I think especially what Senator English uh, has said, there's, there may be a very hard stop at the 24 hours. So it's incumbent upon those that are wanting to testify to submit written testimony 24 hours ahead of time because there may be a process and uh, to then after you submit written testimony, and there's a method of how to do that, that is explained on uh, the Capitol web, the legislative website, then you have to request that you are going to want to have verbal testimony. And there's going to be a guideline as to how you do that. Uh, I will work with uh, the, the house leadership uh, maybe primarily uh, Representative Bellotti and uh, Senator English in the, in the Senate, the two majority leaders, uh, to uh, finalize a guideline on how to do verbal testimony that I will send to all of you on this seminar before the opening day. Uh, you know, there are things like the uh, uh, submit written testimony and then request to testify on Zoom deadline to submit, how to use Zoom, and whether you're going to get, if you request to make verbal testimony, you're going to get a Zoom button and uh, the to convert to uh, the join Zoom button and where you can join the hearing. And there's going to be, you know, what they call, you're going to be in a waiting room. And then when you're ready to testify at a certain time, the, um, staff person will then notify you through chat to join the hearing. So there are going to be some issues that have to be worked out, I'm sure. And, you know, as we go through the process, it's uh, hopefully will be as smooth as possible. But these are some of the things that you need to be aware of. And after I work with the, uh, the Senate and the House on a one page sheet on how to um, uh, do verbal testimony. I will send it to everybody on this uh, uh, seminar. And I'm pretty sure the House and Senate may have something posted at some point uh, before session two. Uh, one Thank other you. point. One other yeah. point. Um, for the Senate side, you know, previously we would accept uh, testimony by email to the committee or committee chair. We're no longer accepting it. So do not send us um, testimony by email. You must go through the portal. Right. And if you send it by email, it will not be included. Uh, and just to reiterate what Senator English said, when you go to the website, right, there is a portal on how to submit written testimony. And you have to have a uh, login initially uh, with an email and a password so that uh, you can uh, officially 
uh, submit written testimony. This has been going on for quite a while, but sometimes I think when people got late in submitting uh, testimony and could not get it through the portal, they would send email to the chair. And that's what Senator English is saying that they're not gonna be as accepting that uh, any longer. Um, I'm, do, Bob, do you know, I'm reading through your questions and one, you have an anonymous attendee that has a lot of questions. Maybe if they can give us their name because you know, the one that's catching my eye says they've attended Senate committees and only the chair and vice chair attended, um, et cetera. Well, you know, the, because everything's on TV and the hearings, uh, most of the members, as you know, are in the offices watching um, and taking care of five things at once. It, this is gonna be the same where we're on Zoom and you may just have the chair in the committee room or the chair on Zoom uh, doing the hosting the hearing and taking it. So. We all, uh, normally we would come in physically in the old style. We would come in when there was a vote because we've been monitoring it uh, in our offices, come in and take the vote based on the recommendation of the chair. Does any, oh, one of the questions I had uh, to, to the panel members, has it been worked out as to, let's assume I'm testifying on a particular bill and a, a member of the committee wants to ask me a question uh, even though there may be a two minute time period and I finish, will the member be allowed to ask me a question at that time? I can take That's that one, Bob, from the House perspective. So chairs have a lot of authority about how they run their hearings. Uh, most chairs will um, leave questions to the end of, a, a, of the bill testimony. Um, and so yes, members uh, for the House who are in a person in the room will be able to ask questions of testifiers. And so it would be important uh, for members of the public to stay on because uh, they may be called upon to testify further or to answer questions. And from the from the Senate side, um, you know, we have great discretion with the chairs. So each chair handles it differently. Some chairs will allow the questions right there. Others will limit the, uh, the questions and uh, still others will take it at the end. But you know, for the most part, I think um, when questions are asked there from the members, that dialogue is allowed. You, you know, uh, panelists, let me uh, mention a question, see if anybody can answer it. If the speakers get a set time, what happens if the hearing goes faster? Might people be called on earlier than, quote, their time? That's why we asked them to come on half an hour earlier. Yeah because there, it's all gonna be monitored by a staff person and uh, corresponding through the chat, right? Okay, right. thank you. Uh, and you know, there also might be questions about um, sequence. So for instance, in the past, um, you know, we gave deference to, you know, if the governor's office show up, we gave deference to um, uh, department or, um, uh, the governor's office or budget and finance, and then we go through sequence. It, that, even that will be up, uh, left up to the chairs um, because um, um, the committee clerk and the clerk's office will be gathering all these testimonies. Sometimes it might be easier just to do it first come first serve. And um, in as much as we want to, you know, uh, group departments together and organizations together, individuals, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, it just might be difficult. So, you know, the earlier that you submit your testimony, you may be able to testify earlier. It depends on the um, chairs. And if, if um, Kalani or Della, uh, if you guys are aware of how other chairs will be doing it, I think we're still deciding what to do, whether it's gonna be first come first serve or not. Yeah, for, for, our, for at least on the Senate side, again, it's up to the chair. And we have some chairs that um, would do it by departments first, agencies second, and then neighbor island people. Others will do, you know, for the chairs, especially from the neighbor islands, they'll generally say, okay, neighbor island guys, if you're here, you can go first. Um, and then others take it as first come, first serve. So uh, we generally leave it to the discretion of the chairs um, and how they want to organize their hearing. You know, one quick question, and then let's take two questions from the Q&A box. Uh, Senator English, you know, with regard to neighbor island uh, uh, people who want to testify, if they don't have video capability, they can just call in, right, just on by the telephone. You know, I, I, uh, I'm 
I don't know the answer to that. Um, that uh -huh. might be difficult uh, to do um, because it's all through, you know, that's oh, why we're I trying see. to set up public spaces for them to go to, that they can make arrangements there. So for instance, at the school in Hana, at the public library, uh -huh. um, and even, you know, some individuals that have access and said people can come to my space. So we're trying to work that as a, those out. Oh, I but see. the reality is, you know, so during the pandemic, I did a huge number of Zoom meetings where I'd have, you know, 800, 900 people on the Zoom meeting from Molokai. Um, I'd have a thousand people from Lanai. There's 2,800 people on Lanai. <laughs> um, you know, I'd have um, 800 people from Hana. I'd have a thousand people from upcountry. So I think the reach of the technology is pretty deep and most people most people have access. There are a few that don't. And, you know, oh, those okay. that have reached out to us. And I just want to segue into, you know, because I'm seeing questions about ADA and accessibility yeah, and those types you. of things. Um, you know, call, I mean, that's, we, we will make arrangements. We will make arrangements for people, but you have to call our clerks and let us know that I want to testify on this, reach out, and then we'll work with you to make sure that you can properly testify and your voice is heard. So we're, we're inclusive, both the House and the Senate, we want to hear from you and we don't want anything standing in the way. So, but you have to let us know and then we'll make sure you're heard. Great, thank you, Senator. Really, two quick questions. Uh, will floor sessions be live streamed both in the House and Senate? Yes. Yep, okay, thank you. Then the other question is, you know, in terms of decision-making uh, after a hearing, uh, if all the committee members aren't present in the hearing room, uh, will there just be an open discussion uh, on Zoom uh, and a vote taken at that time? Well, I can or speak for the Senate side. Our, we have adjusted our rules to allow for remote voting. So yes, it'll be just like you're there, where if the chair decides to take a vote at that point, we can have that dis the question, motions are made, the question is debated, and then the vote is taken. Um, and that can be done with in-person and remote um, participation. Mm -hmm. So that's on the Senate side. Now the House, I'm not sure, you guys might be a bit different. Yep. Uh, so in the House, again, we are gonna have members uh, participating um, in person to vote and ask questions. Now that can change, again, the numbers, uh, the tier system, opening and closing, uh, those things can still be um, um, in flux but we are aiming to do in-person participation and question and voting. So quorum rules will continue to apply uh, for the house uh, committees. I, I think that question, Bob, was actually referring to the process of decision-making. Because uh, yes. I, I think, I think what, what happens sometimes is we'll call a recess and then there'll be a discussion among the members. And as has happened, only the people in the room will actually hear any of the discussion that's offline and then we'll call the meeting back into order and then make and then orally have a discussion on decision making at that point so i i would think that it, again we're going to leave it up to the chairs on how they handle that uh on on whether or not there's going to be some discussion about about what the chair's recommendation is when they come back for decision making but it'll probably be along the lines of the way we've always done it, but you know, dealing with the, with the technology that we're working with. We have you know a little uh, more than half an hour to go, so I'd like to uh, move on. We'll try and answer as many of the questions in the Q and A box uh, as we move along. But let me now turn it over to uh, Representative Luke and Senator uh, Keith Agaron to talk about the budget and the financial issues that uh, will be discussed during this coming session, which is really a key uh, aspect. Everybody wants to know what is happening, how it's going to happen, uh, what are the chances if you have a bill that have appropriations in it, what about the grant in aids, etc. So I'll take the easiest one. Um, the Senate President and the Speaker issued a uh, um, memo, joint memo saying that um, there will be no grants in aid this year just because of the uh, fiscal situation. Um, let me just briefly touch upon the budget. Um, the budget that we will be working on is for 
uh, fiscal year 22 and 23. So in layman's term, what that is, it's the budget starting July um, 2021 um, runs through June of 2023. Um, so it's a two year budget that we're looking at um, currently um, um, based on um, what we're dealing with, with uh, we are looking at a $1.8 billion budget deficit. Um, a $1.8 billion budget deficit, um, just to put it uh, in, um, uh, just to relate it to something um, tangible, um, this, the Department of Education budget is close to about $1.8, $1.9 billion. So essentially, even if we eliminate the Department of Education budget, we still would have very difficulty in balancing. And that's the type of situation that we're in. Uh, we have never had this type of um, budget deficit um, in comparison in um, 2009 Great Recession. Um, it was over a three-year period, um, but they had a... a about $2.1 billion, um, um, or sorry, $1.2 billion budget deficit, I think over uh, a three year period. In this situation, we're looking at a substantially more amount and that amount is going to continue to um, have issues, right? Uh, let me just quickly turn it over to um, Senator uh, Keith Algaron and then I can always pick up. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, really, what, what's what, what will happen with the budget is what happens every year. The House will start and they will take a look at a, a budget draft. At the same time, the Ways and Means Committee will be working on our own draft so that we're once the once the budget passes over to the Senate, then we'll be we'll be holding hearings on different budget issues. One of one of the things I did want to touch on is that uh, unlike the federal government, you know, we do need to pass a balanced budget and we can't spend more than uh, we take in. And how we do that is where we, we kind of control ourselves by relying on what the Council on Revenues projects. Now, I know that um, some of you may be aware that the Council on Revenues just came out with a new projection, which is, you know, probably a little bit rosier than they have been but it doesn't change really the magnitude of the budget deficit that we're gonna be dealing with. The, the other thing that um, people should be aware of is we're a little hamstrung this year with the capital budget as well, because we have uh, limits in the constitution on how much debt we can, um, we can have. And because of some of the steps that the governor has had to take, uh, we are at, at a point where uh, we have some limits on how much capital projects will be, uh, will be um, funded with general obligation bonds. So if, if you take a look at the governor's budget, uh, that's probably the cap of what we're looking at as far as public works projects that are funded by general obligation bonds. Uh, it is, there's going to be some certain kinds of limits as well for the specially funded departments that um, uh, that also have projects. Department of Transportation, um, maybe our boat, little small boat harbors and the like. And uh, I'll let the uh, finance chair chime in and if she has anything about um, any approach that she wants to take on dealing with specific types of uh, budget adjustments, because I know that on our side, I think we're, we, um, our government operations committee uh, is going to be taking a close look at different functions and program areas to see if um, we need to make adjustments broadly. Thanks. Thanks, Gil. Um, let me just make some clarification. Um, uh, so in 2009, when we had the Great Recession, um, it was a $2.1 billion budget deficit over three years. Sorry, I, I said 1.2, it was um, 2.1, but that came with costs, right? Because that, um, that um, impacted um, uh, furlough Fridays, uh, you know, 
for the Fridays were implemented and there were massive program cuts. And even last year, there were, prior to COVID, there were departments still coming back and trying to um, re uh, reinstate or reestablish programs that were still suffering from the 2009 cuts. So as you can imagine, the cuts that we have to do now will be substantially more severe because it's a short amount of um, time period that we need to make up 1.8, $2 billion, $3 billion in a very short time frame. Um, it has been a very painful process. So, you know, I, I encourage you folks to watch the um, current budget briefings that um, Senate WAM and the House Finance Committees are doing. Um, some of the reductions that are being proposed is reduction in um, sex, assault, sex assault treatment centers, um, immigrant services, um, you know, Civil Rights Commission, uh, you know, there will be cuts in health programs, um, a lot of um, purchase of services that impact community services. So, uh, you know, we're very mindful of that. And as we go through every department and talk about some of these cuts, you can see the impact it has on the members because it has been very difficult and heartbreaking at times, but we are, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, we are looking at, you know, not just for the next two years, but what does the budget look like for the next, um, basically four to six years. Going back to the Council on Revenues yesterday, Council on Revenues adjusted the 2021 um, revenue picture uh, upwards. Um, but at the same time, what they did was for 2022 numbers, they adjusted downwards. So what that meant was that for 2021, um, the situation might be a little bit better, but for 2022, they um, adjusted the number downwards, which um, uh, impacted the 2022 numbers, which is the budget year that we're looking at. So um, the amount continued to be uh, significant. One of the things that is not part of the governor this financial plan is the amount that we're borrowing right now to pay for everybody's unemployment claims. Prior to COVID, in the uh, UI trust fund, the state had about uh, a little over $500 million. By July, $500 million was gone. So from July till now, we've been borrowing from the federal government. The amount that has um, that Department of Labor has borrowed from the US DOL is about $700 million. That's only for six months. And that entire $700 million become due on November 2022. We have no inclination from the federal government that they will forgive this loan. They have not discussed any of the um, uh, of, um, any approaches to delaying or forgiving. If that's the case, then um, the state would have to pay for the $700 million. So as you can imagine, that's only for six months. So come 2023, the number could be exacerbated um, unless we uh, you know, see a vast improvement in the economy. Um, so that is kind of what is um, even adding even more to the budget problem. You know, it's overlaying the borrowing that the state is doing for unemployment payments and um, the uh, Department of Budget and Finance already borrowed a separate $750 million just to plug the budget hole currently. So it is going to be difficult. So, you know, we ask the public for your patience. I know um, there are many needs out there, but, um, but the problem is um, any appropriation bill would have to be, um, will have to be balanced with more cuts. So, you know, um, if we were to say, hey, you know, we're gonna appropriate money for, uh, you know, help um, safe travels, uh, that money has to come from somewhere. So that that's gonna mean more cuts to state services, which will have major impact. So we are trying to balance and we ask for your patience in limiting the, um, money requests from the legislature because we are in a situation where you know we probably won't be able to do um, many of those requests. 
you know, just you know. just to follow up on what the chair said, one one of the things that we deal with is that the council and revenues does meet quarterly, so they will have a, a they may have a different projection um, by the time that the budget passes over to the house or from the house to the senate. I haven't looked at the calendar this year to see if that's going to be the case, but the other thing is that. Um, for people who say that we sh we can wait on what the federal government's going to do, um, you know that's one of the things that we were kind of hopeful for all last summer is we were hoping that um, that the Congress was going to come back with additional support for the states. Obviously, that didn't happen. It didn't happen in the in the latest nine hundred million. And we don't know uh, what the Congress will do and how long they will take to do it. Our session ends at the end of April. We need to pass a balanced budget by the end of April. We can't pass a budget and say, well, ho hopefully the Congress will fill in the, fill in the holes. And, and so what, we're, what the approach that we're taking is, as uh, the finance chair says, is we're asking our members to try to limit the number of appropriation bills or to understand that uh, Ways and Means Committee and the Finance Committee are going to be making a lot of hard choices and bills um, bills may not get heard. And because we need, I think we're putting together financial plans. Um, and that's one of the challenges that we have is that the governor submitted a financial plan, uh, but we're not sure how that financial plan is supported by the bills that he, uh, his administration plans to introduce in terms of uh, what kind of revenue enhancements, um, any, if he's talking about any kind of tax hikes you know, or anything else that would impact the budget. And people I think have been making all sorts of suggestions about how we can increase the, the amount of revenue that the, that the state has to to work with but they have to be aware that there's going to be a time lag on a lot of the a lot of the proposals they're saying we're not going to pass a bill that goes into effect sometime next summer and fill a large part of the budget deficit that we need to deal with in passing a balanced budget you know uh, uh senator Agaron and, and rep luke uh uh, let me just ask you this question because people have uh, talked about it uh, privately. You know, when you have uh, new programs that require appropriation uh, from private the private sector, uh, different organizations need certain things. I assume that it will be tough sledding to get a, a large amount of appropriation because what you both just said on the need to balance services by the government and the amount of money that you have. Is that accurate? I mean, not to, not you, you can't commit to that, but I mean, I'm looking at it's gonna to be tough for certain organizations to uh, put in a, a, a bill that requires a, a significant appropriation. Well, I, I think in the finance chair can elaborate on this, but when we, when we're talking about the amount of discretionary spending the state has, there's some things that we um, can't cut. I mean, we, we really can't do much. And so what we're talking about is there's a limited amount of operating funds uh, from the general fund that would be on the table to look at making adjustments on. Uh, we're not gonna be able to, for example, uh, cut our ongoing commitments for uh, retirement benefits and the like. We can't um, cut our debt service. I mean, we might be able to renegotiate and reissue bonds to maybe uh, reduce the debt service for the next two years, but that that that's limited. I mean, we. So what what we're what we're really dealing with is we're looking at the operations that need to continue. I mean, we need to maintain our roads. We need to maintain our our school buildings and the university buildings. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we're not gonna be looking at cutting. I mean, those are things that uh, would be needed regardless of the kind of budget deficit that we're facing. So if we're looking, if we're talking about new programs, 
I, I think it's going to be really tough to um, get the kind of support to pass that that type of legislation this year. Um, and but you know, I wouldn't for I wouldn't foreclose that. I mean, there may be things that um, are so important that we need to deal with it. I know that there's a lot of people in the in the legislature that are interested in dealing with some of the climate change implications, um, not just in the in the future, but in the near term. And if those are the types of spending that we need to do, it, it might be a worthwhile investment. I um, in looking at the cost benefit of what we're what we're facing. Thank you. Um, you know, before we move to the next segment, because we have about 15 minutes left, although we can actually go over the 1030 mark, but I usually like to finish up as uh, on time. Um, the There's a question as to whether or not uh, meeting and conferences with legislators other than uh, on Zoom or by email or by phone, whether because the Capitol is closed, whether there's still going to be an opportunity for members of the public who have issues before the legislature to have personal meetings with any legislator. So I'll turn it over to uh, Senator English and Representative Bellotti to just talk very briefly about this. Yeah, thank you, Bob. So I'll speak on behalf of the Senate side because we have a, a different set of rules. I mean, generally, for us, it's up to each senator, right, at their discretion. But we do have some procedures. So, you know, most of the senators will do Zoom meetings or telephone meetings, et cetera. But for those that they agree to come in, um, they would have to um, get pre approved. We have to submit a name uh, to the sheriffs and to our Senate uh, personnel downstairs. They'll get on a list. One, a member of our staff would have to meet that person at, shortly before their um, appointment at the rotunda downstairs underneath. So you know where you come underneath and that's where you enter. That's the only point to enter the Capitol. Our staff person will meet you, will escort you through. You have to go through the temperature check. You'll get a, um, a sticker that, like this that you place on your, with the day and you place it on your, that you've been temperature checked You'll be escorted up to the meeting. After the meeting, you don't have free roam of the building. After the meeting, our offices will escort you out of the building. So if you make one meeting at 11 with one senator, you cannot then go off to the house and talk to a house member or go talk star with somebody else. We'll escort you out of the building. If you're making at 11 with us and 11.30 with someone else, they'll take you out. You'll meet that other person there and they'll escort you back in and out. So it's up to the members. Um, we're, we're being very cautious of the amount of people coming into the building. Um, you know, each office in the Senate has, uh, we have plexiglass uh, plates up, we have stanchions, uh, we have social distancing spaces, so our staff are spaced out differently. Um, and when people come in, we're asking that, you know, they really, well, it's up to the Senator, right? But we're not, we're saying instead of bringing 10 people from an organization, you know, please, well, that wouldn't be allowed, but uh, bring one person that can speak for many. Uh, we really encourage the use of technology for the meetings. Um, and then finally, you know, uh, given where everything is, we think that it's probably safer for the general public to do remote uh, meetings as well. So we really encourage that, but it's up to each senator how they want to handle their individual meetings. So for example, I just use, you know, for me, um, I have uh, a courtesy call by one of the council generals um, that's new. And, you know, I suggested we do it by uh, remote, but their, their home office, their foreign office wants them to have a personal meeting. So I agreed to that and I set out the rules and we will be, distance apart, we'll be wearing masks the whole time. We'll dispense with the traditional handshakes and all of that. So that's known before they come, right? And the pictures is gonna be, uh, the little trick we use is one is in the front and one is in the back like this and it's six feet or more apart, but in the picture it looks a little bit closer. So that one, we've made an exception. You see the example, yeah? 
So with Senator's announcement, actually, I, I believe the House and the Senate procedures are now more, in fact, aligned. Um, there has, uh, uh, I, I would like to take this time to thank our House Sergeant of Arms, who through um, March really kind of took the reins uh, in their control and tried to set up a procedure that would protect the staff and the members uh, in the Capitol building. And so they really worked out that procedure uh, at the um, bo bottom of the rotunda where people would enter, get temperature checked, uh, sign in, and then be greeted by uh, members of staff who would take uh, authorized personnel to their respective meetings. So that's very much similar to what the House is following. And again, just like the Senate, highly encouraging members to conduct meetings uh, remotely um, through Zoom accounts uh, that have been provided to each member. Um, I think one of the um, silver linings of this pandemic is that uh, virtual testimony has actually, or, or the virtual tools we now have in our toolkit have actually made it very much more possible to, to reach out to members of the public and organizations. And so we can still have a lot of public access, although not in person we still have access with our members and with members of the public. Thank you, Rep. Bilotti. Before we go on, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to tell those that have um, posted questions on the Q&A box, I think that we will probably not have enough time with the, uh, with the time remaining to answer all those questions. But uh, ThinkTech and Zoom, I have a list of all the questions. I will review the questions and probably uh, type them out with an answer uh, to the ones that have not been answered and send it out to all of you uh, that are on this seminar. Uh, the last thing before I forgot to mention it, for those of you that are lobbying at the legislature and have to uh, uh, sign in and, and uh, register, uh, there are new uh, ethics administrative rules that were promulgated and passed. And you need to be aware of that because there are some major changes uh, that you need to be aware of. I think the um, Ethics Commission already had one training session and they have another training session on January 11. So those of you that have to register as a lobbyist, uh, I would strongly recommend that you uh, take in that training because there, there are some major, major changes. I can answer about 10 of these questions in like three seconds. Go ahead. Uh, ADA, ADA um, notices are printed on every single one of the House and Senate's um, uh, hearing notices and it has been done for years that way. So it's a part of our boilerplate language. It's on every single notice. Facts, um, testimonies will not be accepted, only testimonies on our portals. Um, and then, you know, maybe just, I'm seeing a lot of the questions that are sort of projecting a lot of different things. I mean, we're asking people, basically, it's the common sense test, right? We're trying to figure out what's the best and easiest way to get something done. So a lot of the questions are unique circumstances that we may not have reached yet, or we, you know, we'll, We'll cross it when we come to it and there this actually helps us to think about some of them so thanks for posting them but those are the two big ones i wanted to cover thank you senator uh rep luke and senator agaron do you want to make any quick comments on uh the conference committee process is that basically going to be the same uh or is the public going to be able to view the conference committee uh, uh, uh hearings when you both the house and senate get together I know it's going to be shortened. Uh, it's less time for conferences uh, before a closing day, but. I, I think we're, that we're still going to have a lot of discussions about how uh, that's actually going to happen because um, for the most part, you know, con conference committees uh, are really for the members of the conference committee. So just be legislators and the discussions are usually between them. So I, I haven't, we haven't really talked about it um, in practical terms of whether or not just the cameras are going to be on all the time in the conference rooms or, or um, because uh, it, it's, a, it's a shortened time too. And, yes. uh, and I, I think, it's, I think the, the leads on the different conferences are going to have to uh, be very succinct in, their, in the discussions. And 
there's probably going to, and hopefully we'll have the members there to vote if if we actually have a bill that's going to move over. Uh, I think the practical thing to tell people if you're advocating for a bill is, you know, try to avoid conference, which is sort of the <laughs> sort of the advice that um, we give to everybody every year is, you know, try to get the language that you want agreed to on both sides, um, you know, bef before it needs to go to conference committee. And I, I know that's easier said than done, but uh, it is the best thing to do. Uh, uh, Rep. Luke, you have any comment on conferences? No, not on conferences, but, um, you know, something that um, I wanted to highlight um, because you mentioned the new ethics rules. Um, there is a strict um, uh, gift policy that has been implemented and the ethics commission basically got rid of um, the, the token of Aloha or um, uh, token gifts. Um, so uh, even, uh, you know, uh, something small like banana bread from a constituent we're not allowed to take. So um, in as much as possible, if uh, you folks could pass that word around and um, not drop off gifts, because then uh, what we had to do was we had to collect it and um, either ship it back or, you know, um, send it back. And that takes a lot of coordination. So um, there is a strict um, policy that the Ethics Commission came out, um, uh, you know, to some extent, some part doesn't make sense because, you know, if um, somebody in your district want to give you a banana bread, you know, I mean, it's just kind of rude to uh, reject it, but, you know, it is the rule now. So um, it is going to make it easier for us if you folks could cocoa and um, uh, not drop off gifts at the uh, like on opening day, not not deliver gifts to the Capitol. Yeah, Rep. Luke, thanks for mentioning that. You know, an issue came up that I heard about where uh, an organization is sending uh, information to all the legislators and including a very inexpensive mask because of the pandemic. And uh, whether that's a, 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 a allowable or not. I mean, if if the mask costs $2, maybe, I'm not sure. If the mask costs 10 bucks, I don't think it's allowable. Anyway. Yeah, even even if it costs $2, we returned it all. Yeah, so that's, a, that's an issue. Okay, so as we wind up, uh, we have some uh, final, any final comments by um, the panelists? Um, uh, Senator English, any final comments? And then uh, Senator Agaran? Yeah, and sure. Then... You know, we're trying to make this as, as um, easy as possible for everyone. It's new territory for both the House and the Senate. Um, our staff, I really want to thank all of our staff who have been working so hard to put all of this together. And, um, you know, the, I've seen some of the questions where will this be on other than Facebook? Well, we're putting it out on YouTube. Uh, we do put it out on Facebook, but the main archive is on YouTube. And then the Olelo and others will be picking up these as well. So the traditional ways of viewing it is out there, but what both the House and the Senate is doing is making it much more accessible than it's ever been yeah. by what we're using. So, you know, work with us on it, guys. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Agaran, any final uh, quick comments? No, I, I think I just appreciate uh, being being on this seminar today and, and for all the people who um, showed their interest in signing up for it. And I know that, and Bob, you might want to mention this afterwards, is where, uh, the, where this uh, seminar is going to be replayed and available for people who uh, didn't register in advance. Uh, because there's a lot of information that uh, we went through this in this seminar, and there, there's going to be a lot of information that will be available on both the House and the Senate websites, um, as well as the public access room. And, and I, again, I think the best advice is what uh, Representative Bilotti mentioned earlier, which is uh, if, you, if you're even thinking that you may wanna testify at some point during the session, you know, please register for an account so that you'll, you'll get the hearing notices and you'll get the links that you need to submit your testimony. And I think that's very important. Thank you, Senator. And, uh, Representative Bolotti, any final uh, words? Yes, um, I think, 
you know, I'm an optimistic person and we have gone through a rough year, but I really like to look for the good in things. And one of the good in, uh, in this uh, opportunity as Senator Keith Agaron pointed out is that there's an opportunity to actually be more involved and more engaged and more informed. Once you create an account and you want to submit testimony, you're going to find that you can track bills, you can read testimony. So this is a fantastic opportunity to um, increase trust in government and increase participation in government. Uh, the last thing I would like to say uh, is if you enjoy this webinar, this is a great opportunity to thank Bob Toyofuku who put this together and really put us through our paces and asked us really good questions. And it, it's an opportunity for you to lobby him. As Senator G Keith Agaron said, we don't quite know what conference will look like. So I know that uh, Bob puts together these great programs. So lobby him to do another one of these in March. And I think you'll, you'll be able to get uh, some of us back here. Thank you, Bob, for everything you've okay, done. Thank you, Rep. Pilati. Rep. Luke, last words? Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I think uh, one of the things that we're very mindful is uh, we are very sensitive about the, um, the whole uh, virtual hearing and virtual um, session. So we're trying to be even more accessible. So don't be afraid to reach out and, um, you know, ask for a meeting. Um, you know, now, I'm beginning to find out as opposed to doing, you know, 10 live meetings, I can um, whip through 20 virtual meetings because I can go in and, you know, take care of it for 15 minutes and I don't have to walk to another office. You know, I can just go from one Zoom meeting to the next. So, um, so it's, you, you know, I mean, don't be afraid to reach out to your legislators and just ask questions. Uh, you know, I think this is, um, we ask for everybody's patience and you know continue to be safe. Uh, 2021, um, we're hoping for better things, but we're still going to struggle through it. Um, even if the vaccine gets uh, widely distributed by um, the middle of 2021, doesn't mean it's inoculation. Um, people are still going to get sick, and the social distancing uh, masking will continue for a, a, a while. So. Um, you know, be safe and be um, um, be mindful of each other. And, um, you know, we wish you good health and um, best wishes for 2021. Well, thank you, Rep. Luke. While I make my final comments, which will take about a minute and a half, uh, I'd like to have some feedback from the people that are on this uh, seminar and uh, to follow up too on uh, Senator Agaron said, it will be replayed on ThinkTech and also probably on Olelo. And we'll look at other uh, possibilities too. Uh, but anyway, if the, if the people on the, on the seminar can vote, one of the things that I have been thinking about, which Rep. Bilotti mentioned, I am thinking about having another uh, seminar in March after the cr uh, first crossover to bring everybody up to date uh, answer any questions with regard to how the virtual testimony has been going and what they can expect in the second half of the session. So if you're interested in that, there's a question that, that you can click on. Lastly, uh, I want to thank all of you who uh, took the time to uh, sign in and watch this uh, seminar and especially thank uh, um, the panelists. I mean, they have spent time on this, not just today, but we had several get togethers to discuss how the program will be going and going over any kind of schedule and scripts. And so I'd like to thank, really thank Senator uh, English, Senator Keith Agaron, Rep. Bilotti and Rep. Luke for the time they spent and sharing their expertise. And lastly, uh, I want to thank Jay Fidel of ThinkTech and uh, his crew for helping put this on. And uh, again, good luck to all of you and uh, please fill out the evaluation. So that's the end of the seminar. Uh, stay safe uh, as this COVID keeps continuing and uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully in March, if not before. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone.